Okay, so when we last left off, we showcased the algebraic method of calculating the empirical formula. Now let's cover what is known as the stepwise method. So for example, let's suppose we're given a problem where the sample is found to be 40% carbon, 5.1% hydrogen, and 54.2% oxygen by mass. The sample is found to have a molar mass of 118 grams per mole, and we're asked to calculate the empirical and molecular formula. So, following the stepwise method, if you're given the mass percentage of each element, you obtain the empirical formula first by converting the mass percent to the mass of each element, assuming a total mass of 100 grams. You can pick any mass you want, but 100 grams makes things easy. In this case, the mass percent is equal to the mass if you have 100 grams of sample. So just to showcase this, the mass of carbon is equal to 40.7 grams of carbon over 100 grams times 100 grams total, which gives us 40.7 grams of carbon. We'd also see the mass of hydrogen would be 5.1 grams, and the mass of oxygen would be 54.2 grams. Perfect, so far, so good. Now, in our next step, what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert the mass to moles. So in this case, the moles of carbon is our mass, which is 40.7 grams times one mole of carbon over 12 grams of carbon. And if we punch that into our calculator, if we punch that into our calculator, that gives us 3.39 moles of carbon for moles of hydrogen, we have 5.1 grams of hydrogen. Let me make a little bit more space. So we take the grams of hydrogen over the molar mass. So one mole of hydrogen per one gram, which gives us 5.1 moles of hydrogen. Now for our moles of oxygen, we have 54.2 grams of oxygen times one mole of oxygen over 16 grams of oxygen. And that in turn gives us 3.39 moles of oxygen. Okay, so now that we have the moles calculated, you're gonna choose the element with the smallest number of moles. In this case, we have a tie between carbon and oxygen. We're gonna divide the moles of every element by the moles of the chosen element. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna take the moles of carbon and let's divide everything by the moles of carbon. So we're gonna look at the moles of carbon per mole of carbon. This by definition will be one mole of carbon for every one mole of carbon. That's not very interesting. Okay, we know for the moles of hydrogen per mole of carbon, we have 5.1 moles of hydrogen for 3.39 moles of carbon. which gives us 1.5 moles of hydrogen per mole of carbon. Okay, and our mole of oxygen per mole of carbon is 3.39 moles of oxygen over 3.39 moles of carbon, which gives us one mole of oxygen per one mole of carbon. Okay. So now we have our mole ratios established, but they're not whole numbers, and that's a, that's a bit of a problem. So we have one 
mole of carbon, one mole of oxygen, and 1.5 moles of hydrogen. So if the mole ratios are not whole numbers, you're gonna multiply all your mole ratios by the same whole number to give the smallest whole number ratio. So what should I multiply all of my mole ratios by? What should I multiply all of my moles by to get a whole number? What should I multiply all of my moles by in order to get rid of this decimal? If we think of 1.5 as, as 3 over 2, what should I multiply all of my mole ratios two. by? 2, exactly. So that in turn gives us 2 moles of carbon, 2 moles of oxygen, and 3 moles of hydrogen. Wonderful. So that in turn would give us a formula of C2 H3O2. Okay. However, we, 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 can, we can actually take this one step further. So even though we have our empirical formula clearly established, um, just as a side note, this is a table of common fractions and decimals that you should remember to figure out what whole number to choose. In this case, we had a 0.5, so we multiplied by two. Okay. So now that we have our empirical formula, which let's just write that down, C2H3O2, that was our empirical formula. If you are given the molecular weight, you can actually calculate and determine the molecular formula. So in this case, we have to first figure out N by taking our empirical unit mass over our molecular weight. So let's calculate our empirical formula unit mass. So the molar mass in this case would be two times the mass of carbon, which is 12 gram per mole plus three times the mass of hydrogen plus two times the mass of oxygen. That in turn gives us a molar mass of 59 gram per mole. Let's go to the beginning of our problem and let's look and let's find this molar mass. Let's find, let's find our molecular weight. We need that. Okay, the molecular weight or molar mass of our molecule was 118. So let's plug that in. Let's plug that in. So N would be equal to 118 gram per mole over 59 gram per mole. That gives us an N of two. You're gonna multiply the subscript of each element in your empirical formula by N. So C2H3O2, we're gonna multiply each of our subscripts by two to give us C4H6O4. and you can just rewrite your subscripts if you haven't already. So this is our molecular formula. Does this logic make sense to everyone so far? So it's the exact same procedure as the algebraic method, except split into very key distinct steps. Any questions? So we've done one guided example. Let's now take a moment and let's work on 
another guided example. In this case, we are given the percentage of each element and the molar mass. So I'd like you to take a moment and work on this problem for about five minutes. And I'd like you to report the empirical and molecular formula for this compound. And you can submit your responses in the chat or via Canvas under Canvas Quiz 4.8.2. And I'll be checking to see how the class proceeds through each of these problems. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to message me in the chat, unmute and ask your question verbally, or um, to submit your responses for feedback via Canvas. So let's spend about four minutes working on this problem, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And just as a correction for this one, um, you won't be submitting it via Canvas. The next example we will. But you can submit your responses in the chat, and I'll be checking to see how everyone's going through this problem. And if not, we'll discuss in about four minutes. Let's try to get a few responses in the chat for this question, and then we'll discuss in about four minutes. And don't be shy to message or ask questions on this example. I know it takes a few moments to completely compute all of the mole ratios and get your empirical formula, but if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask. If not, we'll discuss in a few minutes. And I'm already seeing some reasonable responses in the chat. Let's try to get a few more responses and then we'll discuss. The responses I've seen so far look perfect. And we'll discuss in another approximately three minutes. <laughs> 
Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat. And we'll discuss in about another two minutes. Okay, so let's discuss this example. It's okay if the first time it's somewhat hard to parse these, the information, but with enough practice, we'll be slowly developing our skills into writing out the empirical and molecular formula. And thank you again for those who responded. So let's take a look. So first and foremost, we're gonna convert each of our mass percentages into masses. Since if we assume that we have 100 grams total mass, which we can always assume, the mass of carbon would be 38.7 grams. The mass of hydrogen would be 9.7 grams. And the mass of oxygen would be 51.6 grams. Perfect. Now to calculate the moles of carbon, we're gonna take the mass, which is 38.7 grams, and we're gonna divide it by the molar mass. So we have one mole of carbon for every 12 grams. And if we punch that into our calculator, if we punch that into our calculator, that in turn gives us 3.225 moles of carbon. Let's continue this process for hydrogen and hydrogen's easy. 9.7 grams. We have one mole of hydrogen per every one gram. Grams cancel. We're left with 9.7 moles of hydrogen. And finally, for the moles of oxygen, we have 51.6 grams times one mole of oxygen per 16 grams. That in turn gives us 3.225 moles of oxygen. We then identify our smallest number of moles. I'm just gonna arbitrarily pick carbon. Completely arbitrary, but it's the smallest number of moles in our list. You could just as easily have picked oxygen. So I'm gonna look at the ratio of the moles of carbon per mole of carbon. That's almost a tautology in a way. We have one mole of carbon per every one mole of carbon. The moles of hydrogen per mole of carbon, so we have 9.7 moles of hydrogen per 3.225 moles of oxygen. And that in turn, gives us, after we punch it into our calculator, 9.7 over 3.225. That in turn gives us 3.00 moles of hydrogen for every one mole, sorry, this should be carbon, for every one mole of carbon. Finally, let's look at the moles of oxygen per mole of carbon which gives us, well, let me write it out, long form. So we have 3.225 moles of oxygen over 3.225 moles of carbon, which gives us one mole of oxygen per one mole of carbon. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now from each of these ratios, we get the following empirical formula. So C1H3O1. 
or CH3O, reading off our one mole of carbon from our denominator, one mole of oxygen, and three moles of hydrogen from our other two mole ratios. So we have our empirical formula. Now let's calculate N. Let's calculate N, and to do that, we look up and we see our molar mass is 62 gram per mole, and now we have to divide by our empirical unit mass. And our empirical unit mass is equal to 12 plus three times one plus 16, which gives us 31 grams per mole. We plug in our empirical formula unit mass and that gives us a value of N of two. So then we write out each of our subscripts and then we multiply them by two, which in turn gives us C2H6O2, which is our final molecular formula. Any questions on this example? Any questions on the logic used in this example? If not, what we're going to do is we're going to apply what we've covered to another empirical and molecular formula example. This time you're given the mass percentages and you are also given the molecular or molar mass of your compound. And from this information, I'd like you to determine the empirical and molecular formula. And this time, I'd like you to submit your responses in the chat verbally or via Canvas quiz 4.8.3. So we'll spend about five minutes on this problem and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. And if you have any questions in the meantime, or if, you're, if you'd like me to provide feedback on your response, don't be shy to message me in the chat or submit your responses via Canvas. And we'll discuss in about five minutes. So looking at 
canvas and the responses in the chat. We already have a few reasonable responses so far. Let's try to get a few more responses and let's continue working through this problem. And we'll discuss in approximately two to three minutes. Sure, sure. If you have a different method of tackling these problems, um, you're certainly welcome to, to share that and I can check if it makes sense. And the, some of the proposed empirical formulas in the chat are looking quite good so far. We have some, a slew of reasonable responses via Canvas. Ah, so... So um, for, for the alternative method of solving these problems proposed in the chat, yes, that method does work. Um, it's just another way of, it's another way algebraically of solving for the empirical and molecular formula. So that method should work just fine. I don't see any, any problems with it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So let's spend about another minute on this problem and then we'll discuss together. I'm seeing that the class is definitely getting faster at this as the students are all submitting responses in the chat and via Canvas and those responses look great so far. So we'll discuss the solution together for our notes momentarily. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. So first and foremost, we're gonna take each of our percentages and convert them into masses. Just again, we're assuming 100 grams total. So the mass of nitrogen is 35.00 grams. The mass of hydrogen is 5.04 grams. The mass of oxygen is 59.96 grams. Okay, now we calculate the moles. So the moles of nitrogen would be 35 grams times one mole of nitrogen 
for every 14 grams. So let's punch that into our calculator. That gives us 2.5 moles of nitrogen. The moles of hydrogen, we have 5.04 grams times one mole of hydrogen per one gram, which gives us 5.04 moles of hydrogen. And then for our moles of oxygen, we have 59.96 grams times one mole of oxygen per 16 grams. Again, let's punch that into our calculator. That gives us 3.75 moles of oxygen. Now we're gonna divide by the smallest number of moles, which are our moles of nitrogen. So our moles of nitrogen per mole of nitrogen, that's a bit of a freebie, that's one to one, okay. Our moles of hydrogen per mole of nitrogen. So we have 5.04 over 2.5. That in turn gives us 2.0 moles of hydrogen per one mole of nitrogen. Next, we looking at the moles of oxygen per mole of nitrogen. We have 3.75 moles of oxygen for every 2.5 moles of nitrogen, which in turn gives us 1.5 moles of oxygen for every one mole of nitrogen. Okay, so now we have a schematic where we have one mole of nitrogen, 1.5 moles of oxygen, and two moles of hydrogen. Now we need to figure out a whole number to multiply each of these moles by in order to get a whole number mole ratio. So what should I multiply each of these moles by? what whole number should I use? What whole number should I multiply each of these moles by? Two, yep. 0.5, that tells us multiply by two. Okay, so that gives us two moles of nitrogen, three moles of oxygen, and four moles of hydrogen, or N2 H4O3, okay? Let's go up and let's look at our molar mass of 80 gram per mole. Okay, so we have our empirical formula and let we know that our molar mass is 80 gram per mole. Let's figure out the empirical mass. Let's figure out the, the, this empirical mass. So we have 14 times two plus four plus 16 times three. And just as a, as a spoiler, you may notice that this problem was set up to be a little bit easier than some of the examples that I showed you because our empirical mass is 80 gram per mole. So we have a perfect match. So this formula that we've calculated is both the empirical and the molecular formula. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Does this make sense to everyone so far? Is everyone comfortable calculating empirical and molecular formulas? This is a critical skill that you'll need for in both lecture and laboratory. The responses I see in Canvas look perfect and the responses I see in the chat look perfect. Let's give everyone one other opportunity to really demonstrate their understanding and complete 
uh, familiarity with calculating empirical and molecular formulas. And let's work on the following example. This time where you have a two component system where you just have phosphorus and oxygen. You're given the molar mass. I'd like you to tell me the empirical and molecular formula and name this compound. And I'd like you to submit your responses via the chat, verbally, or via Canvas Quiz 4.8.4. And don't be shy if you have any questions to ask them via the chat, verbally, or via a Canvas message. And we'll discuss this example in about five to six minutes. And pretend like this question, and you may see something similar, that, that pops up on your exam. How would you go about it? How would you check your work? And these kinds of questions will appear throughout this week's quiz and definitely will appear on the next exam. So you wanna make sure you're comfortable with these questions. And wow, we already see some responses in the chat and Canvas. Um, Let's spend another five to six minutes working through this problem and then we'll discuss as a group. Practice makes perfect. So this will be your chance to try to go through this problem from start to finish uh, and try to get it as correct as possible. And if there are any questions, really don't be shy to ask. And I'll be checking Canvas and the chat to see how everyone's progressing. Wow, we already have a fair number of responses via Canvas for the empirical and molecular formula. It's good. People are getting faster at these examples and reporting with greater accuracy. So let's keep, let's keep working through this problem. And we'll discuss in about another four to five minutes. So those responses that I'm seeing in the chat look perfect so far. And the empirical and molecular formula that I saw in the chat just now looks perfect. 
So let's, we'll keep working through this problem. Let's try to get almost the entirety of the class we have today providing some responses and we'll discuss in about another two to three minutes. We have almost the entire class responding. Let's try to get a few more responses just so that way when we go over the solution, we can provide some feedback. And if you don't wanna respond via Canvas, don't be shy to post a question or a response in the chat. And we already have some people trying to name this compound and The name looks perfect from some of the names I see in the chat look perfect so far. Okay, so let's now discuss this example together as a class. So we know each of the mass percentages, so we can quickly, again, always writing our assumptions, we're assuming 100 grams total mass. You can assume any total mass you want. We have 56.4 grams of phosphorus and we have 43.6 grams of oxygen. So to calculate the moles of phosphorus, we take 56.4 grams times one mole of phosphorus per every 31 grams of phosphorus. Punching that into our calculator, we get 1.82 moles of phosphorus. Now to calculate the moles of oxygen, we have 43.6 grams times one mole of oxygen over 16 grams. That in turn gives us 2.73 moles of oxygen. Now to take the mole to mole ratio. So the moles of oxygen over moles of phosphorus are equal to 2.73 moles of oxygen over 1.82 moles of phosphorus. And if we punch that into our calculator, that in turn gives us 1.5 moles of oxygen per every one mole of phosphorus. So we have one mole of phosphorus. We have 1.5 moles of oxygen. What do I need to multiply each of my moles by to get a whole number ratio? What do I need to multiply both of my moles by in order to get a whole number ratio. By two, exactly right. Everyone's quite fast with their responses. So we have two moles of phosphorus and three moles of oxygen. So that gives us P2O3. That's our empirical formula. 
Now let's go through and calculate the molecular formula. So N, we need our molar mass, which is 220 grams per mole. Okay, and now we need to get the empirical mass of this subunit. So let's calculate that. We have 31 grams per mole for phosphorus times two plus 16 grams per mole for oxygen times three. And that in turn gives us an empirical molar mass. And you know, if, you, if, if you've done everything correctly, the numbers should very cleanly match and be a multiple of your molecular formula. So we get 110 grams per mole. So then solving for N, we get an N of two. So P2O3, we're gonna multiply each of our subscripts by N, which is two, and that gives us P4O6. That's our final molecular formula, which we call this tetraphosphorus hex oxide. Let me write that over here. There we go. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? If not, if not, let's keep going and let's talk about a concept very closely related to empirical formulas, which is this idea of polymers. So polymers are large molecular weight compounds composed of a repeating monomer unit. So a monomer unit is the smallest repeating molecular formula unit in a polymer. So already this is starting to sound a lot like empirical and molecular formulas. So we have a special term to describe polymers called the degree of polymerization, which is the number of monomer units in a polymer. So the degree of polymerization is equal to the molar mass of your polymer over the molar mass of your monomer. So you can draw very close parallels to our formula for N, where we looked at the molar mass of your molecular for formula over the molar mass of your empirical formula. That's why I'm talking about polymers now, because the, the calculations are very similar to that of calculating empirical formulas. Okay, so to give you an example, polystyrene polymer looks something like this. So in terms of styrene, so you may be asking, what is styrene? So polystyrene is the polymer of styrene. Styrene as a monomer looks something like this. So by stringing together multiple polystyrene monomers, you can generate these long polymer chains, each with unique properties. Polystyrene is a principal component of many cups and it's a principal component of packaging material. And in a polystyrene polymer, and many of these polymers can be woven together to make interesting materials, we have many thousands of monomers linked together to form large molecules known as polymers. Okay. So let's, let's, let's just look at empirical and molecular formula in the context of polymers. So this will be a nice example showing the application of what we've learned to another subfield of chemistry. So a sample is found to be, have these mass percentages of each element. Here to determine the mole percentage of each element, determine the empirical formula 
And given the molecular weight of 62,000 grams per mole, I'd like you to determine the molecular formula. So let's take a few minutes, let's take about five to six minutes to work through this example. And even though we're applying what we've learned to a polymer system, it's still fundamentally calculating an empirical and molecular formula. So let's take a few minutes and you can submit your responses in the chat or via Canvas quiz 4.8.5. Really want to make sure we can calculate empirical and molecular formula and calculate mole percent from mass percent. And we'll discuss this example in about five to six minutes. And if you have any questions at all, don't be shy to message me your questions in the chat or unmute and ask your questions verbally. If you're familiar with common materials and you happen to know the name of this compound, has a very common abbreviation commonly found in piping, um, you can also message that in the chat just to expose some of your fellow classmates to common chemicals and materials that we work with in our day-to-day -day lives. If not, we'll discuss this example in about five to six minutes. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to message them in the chat or ask them verbally. And I already see some reasonable submissions for the empirical formula in the chat and via Canvas. Let's try to get a few more responses and we'll discuss in another four to five minutes. 
And let's try to get a few more responses in the chat or via Canvas. And we'll discuss, I see everyone's pretty comfortable calculating the empirical molecular formula and the mole percentage is a little bit more tricky. Remember, once you have the masses, you can calculate the moles and total moles quite easily. So let's spend about another two to three minutes on this example and then we'll discuss. And in the chat, the empirical and molecular formulas I see look quite good. And via Canvas as well, the empirical and molecular formulas look quite good. So we'll spend about another one to two minutes on this example. And then we'll discuss. So let's discuss this example and let's break it down into its different pieces. So um, the reason why I like this problem is because it gives you another way, another way of, of, of calculating the empirical formula, or it's a, it's a more, it's another way of thinking about calculating the empirical formula. So first things first, we're going to assume that we have a hundred grams total. Again, always state your assumptions. We have 38.7 grams of carbon, 4.8 grams of hydrogen, and 56.5 grams of chlorine. Okay, we know that the moles of carbon is 38.7 grams of carbon over 12 gram per mole, which in turn gives us our moles of carbon to be 3.225 moles of carbon. Okay. Our moles of hydrogen are equal to 4.8 grams over one gram per mole, which gives us 4.8 moles of hydrogen. And then our moles of chlorine are equal to, oops, 56.5 grams of chlorine over 35.5 grams per mole, which in turn gives us a molar mass, oh sorry, it gives us a moles of chlorine of 1.59 moles of chlorine. So just as a side note, from this information, we can calculate our total moles by adding up each of our moles. 
which in turn gives us a total moles of 9.615 moles. And from that information, we can calculate the mole percentage of each element Sorry about that, just adjusting the view. There we go. Okay, so now that we have the total moles, we can calculate, for example, the mole percentage of carbon by taking the moles of carbon over our total moles. And that in turn, gives us our mole percentage of carbon to be equal to 33.5%. Well, five, four following, oh, well, five following sig fig rules. the mole percentage of hydrogen would be equal to 4.8 moles of hydrogen over 9.615 moles times 100%. And that gives us for our mole percentage of hydrogen, 0.2%. And then finally, our mole percentage of chlorine is 1.59 moles of chlorine over 9.615 moles total times 100%, which in turn gives us 16 point Whoops, let me double check this first, the second calculation. I think there was a calculator error when I entered it. 4.8 over 9.615 would give us 50%. There we go. I noticed something was off because the percentages were not adding to 100. If we add all of our mole percentages together, we see that all of our mole percentages add to 100%, so we're good to go. Okay, so that's how you'd calculate the mole percentage. Now let's look at our empirical formula. So we have all of our moles calculated, so we're gonna divide by the smallest number of moles. So the moles of carbon over the moles of chlorine so we have 3.225 moles of carbon divided by 1.59 moles of chlorine, which in turn gives us 2.2 2 moles of carbon per one mole of chlorine, okay? Now let's look at the moles of carbon per mole of hydrogen. So we have 3.22, oh, whoops, sorry. We should be dividing by the moles of chlorine for each. So we'll look at the moles of hydrogen per mole of chlorine, which gives us 4.8 moles of hydrogen over 1.59 moles of chlorine which in turn for our moles of hydrogen per mole of chlorine, if we punch that into our calculator, that gives us three moles of hydrogen per one mole of chlorine. 
Okay, so we're beginning to get somewhere here. We're almost done with this problem. We're almost done with this problem. So this gets us a formula of C2H3Cl, okay? And now we know that our molar mass is 62,000. And for our empirical mass, our empirical molar mass, we have 12 times 2 plus 3 plus 35. That in turn gives us, if we're calculating N, we have 62,000 over 62. That gives us an N of 1,000. <laughs> Polymers are pretty large molecules. So that would give us a molecular formula of C1000, oh, sorry, C, sorry, C2000, H3000, CL1000. So polymers are quite large molecules, but the process for calculating the empirical and molecular formula remains the same. Any questions on, the, on this example? All of the responses that I've seen so far via Canvas look good so far. Well, what is the 12 times 2 plus 3 plus 35 in the green? Ah, yeah. So looking at, so looking at our, so first things first, for our molar mass, we have 62,000. For the 12 times 2, it's 12 because we have a molar mass of 12 for carbon. We have two carbon atoms. The three is for our three hydrogen atoms. And the 35 is for our one chlorine atom. Okay, that makes sense now. Perfect. And I, yep, yep. Any other questions on this example? If not, Let's now talk about a few other cases where we can use mass percent, mole percent, and mass to mole conversions to begin to process and calculate empirical formulas. So this next type of problem is known as a metal combustion problem. So looking at this metal combustion problem, let's read through this problem from start to finish and then let's think about how we can process this problem. So first and foremost, a two gram sample of lithium metal was burned to produce 4.31 grams of a lithium, lithium oxygen compound. And we're asked to figure out the empirical form. So there, there are two methods of doing this. The first of which is sort of the cheating method. I know lithium has a charge of lithium two plus. Oxygen has a charge of two minus. I can cross my charges and get lithium oxide. This method only works if you know your metal charge. So this may not work so well for a transition metal. And that's just the price that we pay. Now, suppose we, we're dealing with a transition metal. Let's write out a scheme for what's going on here. So we have two grams of lithium metal. We add some amount of oxygen and we end up at the end of this process with 4.31 grams of a compound containing lithium and oxygen. Okay, now what, if, if, if we wanna figure out the moles of lithium per mole of oxygen, this fundamentally is, our, is the idea behind our empirical formula. We want to figure out our mole to mole ratio. We're probably going to need to know 
the mass of lithium and the mass of oxygen. Well, we know the mass of lithium. That's pretty easy. We're given it in the problem. How would I figure out the mass of oxygen? How would I figure out the mass of oxygen? What law can I invoke? What law can I use to figure out the mass of oxygen? If I know I have two grams of lithium to start and I end with 4.31 grams of my product, that has lithium and oxygen, where did all this extra mass come from? Where did all this, what, where did all this mass that we gained come from? Uh, conservation of matter. So the law of conservation of matter would help us calculate the mass of oxygen because all of this extra mass in our lithium oxide compound came from our oxygen. So then we know that the mass of lithium plus the mass of oxygen, these are our reactants, is equal to the mass of our lithium oxide compound, which are our products. So then what we can do is we can solve and say that the mass of oxygen is equal to the mass of our lithium oxide compound minus the mass of lithium which gives us 2.31 grams of oxygen. Now from our 2.31 grams of oxygen, now that we have the mass of oxygen and we know that the mass of lithium is 2.00 grams, we can calculate the moles. So the moles of oxygen are equal to 2.31 grams of oxygen times one mole of oxygen over 16 grams. So let's now punch this into the calculator. So we have 2.31 over 16, which gives us 3.16. Oh, whoops. One moment. 2.31 divided by 16, which gives us 0 0.144 moles of oxygen. To figure out the moles of lithium, we take 2.00 grams of lithium times one mole of lithium over 7.0 grams. That in turn gives us 0 0.286 moles of lithium. So now all we have to do is if we take the moles of lithium over the moles of oxygen, we get 0 0.286 moles of lithium over 0 0.144 moles of oxygen, which in turn, if we punch that into our calculator, simplifies to two moles of lithium for every one mole of oxygen, our formula of lithium oxide of Li2O. So this is our empirical formula. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Does this make sense to everyone so far? Any questions? So you use the law of conservation of mass to figure out the mass of oxygen or whatever element reacted with your metal. And then from that, you have both the masses, you can calculate the moles, and then calculate the empirical formula. A pretty clever method, actually. Now to check that everyone is comfortable with this kind of problem solving process, let's look at the following problem solving example, where we look at the combustion of cobalt. So this time you can't you can't uh, just use your nomenclature rules since I didn't tell you the charge of cobalt. So I'd like you to work through and determine the empirical formula of this compound and submit your responses via the chat or Canvas quiz 4.8.6. And we'll discuss, and we'll discuss in about four to five minutes.
And don't be shy if you have any questions to submit your questions in the chat or submit your responses via, chemis, via Canvas or in the chat. We already see a few reasonable responses via Canvas and in the chat. Let's spend about another three to four minutes on this question and we'll discuss momentarily. Let's try to get a majority of the class submitting responses. So that way, when we go over the solution, you can look through and revise any potential differences in how you solve the problem and address and ask any questions you had when working through this problem on your own. And we'll discuss in about two minutes. Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat or at least some questions. The responses that I see so far in Canvas look perfect so far. Let's try to get a few more responses just to make sure I can see everyone's comfortable with these examples. And then we'll discuss in about another minute to a minute and a half. Okay, we have a 
almost the entire class responded. So let's now discuss this example and all the responses I've received were perfectly correct. So I like to draw a picture. So I have 3.94 grams of cobalt. I have some amount of oxygen. And in the end, I ended up with 5.00 grams of a cobalt oxide compound. Okay. So we know by conservation of mass that the grams of oxygen in our sample are equal to 5.00 grams, which is the mass of our product minus the mass of our other reactant cobalt. That in turn gives us 1.06 grams of oxygen. Our grams of cobalt are equal to 3.94 grams of cobalt. Okay. Oops, one moment. Let me zoom in so that way it's very visible. There we go. So now we can calculate the moles of oxygen by taking our grams of oxygen and dividing it by the molar mass. That in turn gives us 2.05 moles of oxygen. For our moles of cobalt, we have 3.94 grams of cobalt. And let's look up cobalt's molar mass really quickly. We know in one mole of cobalt, we have 58.9 grams. So let's punch that into our calculator. So we have 3.94 over 58.9. And that in turn, 3.94 over, whoops, there was an error in the first calculation. One moment. So we have 0 0.0668 moles of cobalt. For our moles of oxygen, we have 1.06 divided by 16, and that gives us 0 0.0663 moles of oxygen. So now from here, now that we have the moles of each of our component elements, we can take the mole to mole ratio to get our empirical formula. So the moles of cobalt per mole of oxygen are equal to 0 0.0. 668 moles of cobalt over 0 0.0663 moles of oxygen, which in turn gives us one mole of cobalt for every one mole of oxygen, or an empirical formula of COO. So this is our empirical formula. Does that make sense to everyone so far? Any questions so far? Everyone did quite well on this problem solving set. Let's do a, another type of problem. This is gonna be the last type of problem that we'll cover in this session. So I'll show you an example of how to solve these problems. And then you will attempt an example on your own. And that'll wrap up today's lecture, second lecture session. So a compound with the formula KCLOX was found to contain 28.9% chlorine by mass. What is the value of X and what is the name of this compound? Okay, so first and foremost, we know that the mass percentage of chlorine is equal to the mass of chlorine over our molar mass times 100%. Now the trick in this problem is to write out this molar mass. So the molar mass of KClOx would be equal to the molar mass of potassium, which is 39 gram per mole, plus the molar mass of chlorine, which is 35 gram per mole, plus the molar mass of oxygen, which is 16 gram per mole, except, and now this is really important, 
we have one potassium, one chlorine atom. How many oxygen atoms do we have? How can we represent the number of oxygen atoms in our molar mass calculation? What would we write our number of oxygen atoms as? One, two, three, what would we write our number of oxygen atoms as? We'd write it as X, exactly right, exactly right. So now all we have to do is substitute. So 28.9%, which is the mass percent of chlorine, is equal to the mass of chlorine, which is 35 gram per mole, over our molar mass, which is equal to 74 gram per mole plus 16 times x. All of this times 100%. So now what we can do is we can solve for x. So we're going to move this term to the left. So we have 79 times 28.9 plus, oh, sorry, did. Where did you get the 79 from? Ah, if we add, oh, sorry, not 79, 74, sorry about that. And that's obtained by adding our 39 and 35 in this molar mass calculation. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're just distributing this 28.9 term, and we still have our x term to solve for. Let me make it a different color so we can see what we're solving for here. Okay. And now this entire expression is equal to 35 gram per mole times 100%. Now continuing our process of solving for X, we have 16 grams times 28.9 times x is equal to 3,500 minus 74 times 28.9. That in turn gives us 462.4 times x is equal to 3,500 minus 74 times 28.9, which gives us 1,361.4. So then solving for X, we have 1,361.4 over 462.4, which gives us a value of X of three. And if you've done everything correctly, X should be a whole number. Now plugging in, that would give us a formula of KClO3, which would be called potassium chlorate. There we go, and that's it. So, in summary, we write out an equation using our mass percent formula. We write out the mass of our element that we know the mass percentage of, and we divide by our molar mass. We write our molar mass in terms of x, and then we just solve this equation algebraically for x. Does that example make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with this example? Can you explain again why you keep the 35, the molar mass of um, chloride on top? Ah, because if we're calculating them, if we have the mass percentage of chlorine, it's the mass of chlorine over the molar mass. So the mass of chlorine must be on top. Thank you. Perfect. Any other questions I can address? Okay, so 
let's take a moment and let's work through and apply our knowledge to the following example, which is 4.8.8. .8. So let's work on this example for about five to six minutes, and then we'll come together as a group to discuss. So in this case, you're trying to figure out the formula given the mass percentage and try to name this compound while you're at it. You can submit your responses in the chat or via Canvas quiz 4.8.8. .8. And we will discuss this example in about five to six minutes. If you have any questions at all, really don't hesitate to ask or to unmute and ask your question verbally. And I'll be checking Canvas in the chat to see how everyone's progressing. And wow, we already have a few responses for these questions. That's good. That's good. And we'll discuss in about three to four minutes. Let's try to get a few responses via Canvas and in the chat. And we'll discuss momentarily. And if there are any questions, don't be shy to ask. We'll discuss in about two minutes. 
let's try to get a few more responses before we discuss. Okay, so let's discuss this example. So we know we have a formula of CuOxH2, okay? So we know we have 65.1% copper by mass. So we know that the mass percentage of copper, which is 65.1%, is equal to the, is equal to the mass of copper over our molar mass. Now our molar mass is equal to the mass of copper, which is 63.5 grams, plus the mass of oxygen, which is 16 grams per mole, times X, plus the mass of hydrogen, which is one gram per mole, times two, okay? Now all we have to do is substitute in our expression for our molar mass into our mass percentage. So we get 65.1% is the mass of copper, which is 63.5 gram per mole over 65.5 gram per mole, combining these two terms, plus 16 gram per mole times X, times 100%. Okay, now all we have to do is solve for x. So we now have a simple algebraic equation after we've dealt with the chemistry behind this equation. So we just move this term to the left-hand side. So we have 65.1 times 65.5 plus 16 times 65.1 times x is equal to 63.5 times 100. That in turn gives us, when we punch this into our calculator, six thousand three hundred fifty is equal to 4,264 plus 1,048 times x. So solving for x, we get 6,350 minus 4,264 over 1,048. And that in turn gives us a value of x of two. So we have a formula of CuOH2, which would otherwise be known as copper two hydroxide. There we go. The responses I've saw, seen in the chat and via Canvas looked quite good so far. Any questions for this problem? Any questions for these types of problems? So if not, what we're going to do, this is the end of our chapter four lecture.